Uh, welcome, everybody. Robert McGinnis, so great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ari. This is going to be super fun. I'm excited to talk to everyone, talk to you, and uh, see what questions people have. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, as we begin, you know, people joining in, watching in, this uh, should be interactive. Please post uh, any thoughts, questions, you know, fan points, uh, anything you like, and uh, we'll be reading them throughout and, and addressing them. So, yeah, Robert, uh, you know, with RKM Racing and the Andretti Autosport, uh, we and I got to know each other uh, over the last, like, spring and summer. Uh, Data Robot is... You know, very proud and excited to have partnered and sponsored. Uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, there it is. Um, it's backwards on video. <laughs> yeah, uh, looks very good. Uh, especially, you know, we'll share some photos later. But yeah, you reached the podium a, a couple times, which is a very challenging and, and great achievement. Um, but yeah, we we had the opportunity, pleasure of going to a whole bunch of cities. Um, to follow you around and gotten to know, you know, what it's like, uh, how you prepare for each race, how you go through, um, you know, uh, the, the preparation beforehand and afterhand and, you know, realizing that it's uh, not just one race, it's, you know, in a given weekend, uh, you know, you, you set, you know, who gets the position, you do a race, you do another race the next day, then it's on to another city. But yeah, I've been to you know, Indianapolis Motor Speedway was was amazing, um, and COVID, and you know Barber out near Atlanta, um, St. Louis coming up. But uh, I just wanted to establish that you know you and I have spent many many times uh, together. It's been a pleasure. I've actually brought uh, two of my three kids, so it's a, a, a fun family fair as well. But why don't we start and uh, give yourself an introduction? Yeah, totally. Um, so it has been super fun getting to know you, Ari. Uh, for everyone, I'm Robert McGinnis. I'm the driver of the number 27 and Dritty Autosport Indy Lights car, partnered with Data Robot. Um, yeah, I started racing at about 10 years old in go karts, moved up through the karting ranks, ended up racing at international, Pan American national championships. I moved into race cars when I was 15 years old at a junior level in Formula Ford. Uh, 15, you know, sounds pretty young to drive a race car. I think it is pretty young. I had my uh, racing license to race cars about three, two, three years before I actually was able to get my road license. Um, and then at 16, I moved up to uh, the bottom level of the Indy car series. Since then, I moved up to Indy Lights. Now in my second year of Indy Lights, I've won races. I finished time the championship. I'm racing with Andretti Autosport. Oh, my God. Andretti Autosport. Um, <laughs> who, you know. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of Michael and Mario Andretti. They're racing legends. They race in Formula One. They've won Indy 500s. They've won IndyCar championships. They're as good as they come. So it's it's been awesome working with that team and learning from them and uh, partnering with them. Um, and yeah, so uh, we're doing pretty well this year. We have two podiums so far. Uh, we have St. Louis coming up next week, which is our uh, first oval race of the year and our only two oval races of the year. So I'm super excited for that. Um, and yeah, no, it's, it's been, a, it's been an awesome season. It's been awesome partnering with Data Robot too. And, you know, being able to spend time with, with people like Ari and um, I'm sure some of you guys read the blog, but it's, it's been a blast having them on board. Yeah, that's great. And, and thanks to everyone starting to, to post things. We have somebody uh, tuning in from the Ukraine, from the Kiev, wow. from San Antonio. Um, so, so that's super good. And you mentioned the blog. So I'll pull that up. Um, it, it's kind of a, a story, a little bit more personal of you know, observation, some cool photographs uh, that we both had uh, put in there. You know, some of you, uh, you know, celebrating and, and uh, on the podium, but you know, it's also good to, uh, you know, they call it uh, fail and fail fast. So don't always win, but when you don't, it's, uh, you know, learning what can you do better. Sometimes you can't figure out anything. I, uh, I come from a, the world of Major League Baseball, and my son plays competitive chess. And sometimes you can learn. Sometimes, you, you know, you you, uh, you know you can't. Uh, uh, but that that's all part of it. And we'll get in into that in a minute. But if you have a chance, uh, you know, go to that link in the blog, and um, I'll leave that up there for another minute or two. And you know, one of the things you said was really fascinating. And um, 
and, and that was when I was at the uh, Indy, uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, you know, as we were waiting for you uh, to race, there were these like 15 year olds. Uh, and I had no idea that you could do something like that uh, before you can get your actual driver's license. Um, and they were going fast. It was, it was impressive. But what, what was it like for you um, at that age? Um, I mean, for me, 15 years old, moving into race cars, I, I, I tell the story all the time. It wasn't even when I was, when I was 15, when I was about 12, 13, um, I was racing in go-karts. I was really, you know, racing up like, like the Northeastern regional championships. And I was about 13 when I decided just cause I loved it. I was like, Oh, I'm going to be a race car driver. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And then at 15, I moved into race cars. So I don't think I really understood what it meant to go 150 miles an hour um when you're that young but i i loved it you know the second i got into a race car yeah you drive go-karts it's super fun you learn a lot you have a good time you're racing but as soon as you step into a race car it's a totally different beast and there's so much more going on you're shifting the suspension the car's moving all over the place the other cars around you everything's happening so much faster it's there's nothing there's no way to describe it besides it just being so much fun and just a just sensory overload right um, but it's crazy to think about how much I've learned and how much I've matured since then, right? I'm 21 now, you know, I've been racing cars for, for six years. And when I look back, I thought I was so fast. I thought I was so good when I was in 1600, when I was 15. And I look back at it now and I watch some of my old videos and I'm like, wow, I was so <laughs> bad. I was so slow. And so, no, it's, um. It's actually been, it's been great to see how I've progressed and learned and how I'm, you know, been able to strengthen, yeah, every part of my racing game, but really just maturing as a person, how much that has really helped me get results and do better in the races. Yeah, that, that, that's great, that um, you know, overall picture. And yeah, uh, you know, speaking of younger, you know, the other thing I wanted to emphasize is how great your family is. It's, uh, you are part of a larger team, your father, Gary, your mother, Helen, the brother of George. Um, yeah, lo love to hear more about them. And it just reminded me, like, you know, the younger George is now, I don't know if he got off to Sweden, but kind of where you were uh, like six or so years ago. But yeah, tell us about your, your family. Yeah, no, I mean, you think about racing, you think about race cars, it's definitely not, you know, going to a, going to a soccer game once, a, you know, every Saturday. There's a lot that goes into it from from every angle right it's a big commitment for for a family to take that on and so i have i have awesome i have awesome i have an awesome family right i have awesome parents who support me and and help me do this um you know Ari knows he's been to the racetrack it's it's a it's a full day you know spending the day with people from from data robot my dad will take people around the track he'll show them different cars you you watch the race with my dad right i think there are very few experiences like sitting next to the driver's dad while his kid's going 200 miles an hour, six feet away from him. Um, so no, it's, it's a full commitment family effort. You know, my mom, I think she, she's the one who really makes so much of it happen behind the scenes. And she's always at the races. She's always having a good time. Um, I think it's harder for her to watch me race than I think she'll admit. Um, but we, we all have, have so much fun. And then my little brother, George, uh, he's 16 now. Uh, he just moved out of go-karts into cars, actually, at 16. He signed his first contract. Um, I'm not sure if you know what um, no. what Rallycross is, uh, but he's basically going to be racing cars over jumps through tarmac and dirt at 16 years old. So at 16 years old, he's going to be going over, you know, 120 miles an hour through the air in a race car. So uh, he's in Sweden right now, actually training, um, getting ready for the start of the season in in September, in September for him. So it, it is a full family effort. We, you know, I'm, I have 25 races this year, this season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every, every race is a different city, a different location. And it's a, it's an entirely different ordeal, but, but I, we all love it. We all love this life. And, you know, it's, it's my, it's my full-time job. I'm also a college student at Fordham University, mm -hmm. but, you know, racing is my full-time job. And it's it's become a 
a full-time job for everyone. <laughs> yeah, that, that's so, ambitious. Yeah. What are you um, studying at Fordham? So I'm actually a philosophy student at Fordham. Um, I'm part of Fordham's professional school, right? I, I do not have the time to do a full course load. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I take a few classes a semester and kind of make it work the way that I can. But um, yeah, I, I just love philosophy, right? I love the deep thinking. Um, I love, you know, sitting and having those engaged dialogues with their students, with professors about, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? Why do people think like that? Why, you know, why are we here? Th those questions and those conversations, just the way that people approach life, I think it's so interesting from a philosophy standpoint. And I think I take a lot more out of it than I think into my racing. You know, I think there's just the deeper level of thinking, having to use my brain in ways that I haven't before. I think that that translates to performance out of the racetrack. And that's, that's not why I do philosophy, but I think that it, um, it only helps to go to school and take classes and keep yourself intellectually stimulated. That, that's great. Yeah. Um, there's so much to, uh, to process there, but yeah, it's great to bring in uh, different, uh, you know, parts of your, your brain and your thinking to be even keeled and, you know, psychology of, uh, you know, winning a competitive sports is super important. So things to keep you interested and focused is extremely helpful. I've seen that in baseball, you know, as well as, um, you know, whether they play chess beforehand, but keeping them, you know, both in the moment, like the precision and the focus, you know, for those that that race, you know, 45 minutes or so is incredible. The precision uh, is unbelievable that you need, but then also it's what we call in baseball a grind. It's, you know, you're, you're in dozens of cities, you're on the road, you know, probably more than half of the year. So that precision, but then doing things for the long haul, you really need to keep, uh, you know, keep your brain stimulated the best it could, especially, you know, when, when you're young. So that's great. And, but, you know, a whole bunch of more comments and thoughts. Um, we have people, we have a second person from San Antonio. So maybe you two can meet up at some point. Boston, St. Petersburg, Florida, near where one of the races was. Nepal, um, so Ukraine, Nepal, Charleston, um, so yeah, appreciate everyone uh, dialing in. And yeah, you were talking about your younger brother, George, you know, one, one comment, you know, how, how cool the families and, and how you prepare is, uh, you know, I got to sit next to him for, you know, for a couple hours, um, over a couple days and for like an entire hour waiting for you to race. He was watching videos of who he might be competing in, in, in Sweden. So he was like getting, you know, the dirt track, running through his mind where the curves were, uh, track conditions, tendencies of opponents. Um, so I thought that that was uh, really cool. And uh, how much of that do, do you do? Like I know every, one of the things we were talking about was like every racetrack is different, different curves, different uh, knowing where you can pass and where you can't pass, um, you know, it was crucial. So you know, how, how do you prepare when you're going to a new city? Um, I, there's a lot of different ways uh, that preparation kind of comes into play. Um, and I kind of split up into a few different, a few different parts. I say, um, one of the biggest, uh, I guess our biggest tool for preparation is the simulator, right? Um, I spent a lot of time practicing on a simulator. I have a simulator in my house, I would show it to you, but it's covered with a bunch of sheets because we have a giant crack inside of our wall that we have to fix. Um, but lots of sim training, right? I have every track I've ever driven laser scanned into my into my simulator. I have every car I've driven. On every mm -hmm. car, I can change every piece of the setup I can change in real life on this sim. And so it's it's not just me driving around and getting used to the track. I'll go and I'll, I'll gather data from my team, right? I'll go and I'll tweak the rear wing, I'll make, uh, I'll make an adjustment where it's half a degree higher and I'll go a hundred pounds stiffer on the front spring and I'll take, you know, I'll feel how that makes the car change and how it feels different. I'll change track conditions. I'll change the air temperature. I'll change the wind direction. I'll change how many cars have driven before me. I'll do all these things to change all the conditions and be a hundred percent ready for this track and be able to take that data to my team and say, Hey, this is what the car did when we did this. 
uh, this is what, you know, I feel like I need to do with my driving to be faster on this racetrack. And so the simulator is a huge, a huge tool for us. And not only do I use the simulator here, uh, but there are a couple of simulators that I'll fly to go use. I um, have spent some time on a uh, Toyota's simulator, which is a huge rig with tons of projectors. You're in a cockpit above the ground that's moving. You have a helmet on. It's, you know, that's treated like a full, a full test day. Uh, I just got back from, um, from Honda simulator where I was uh, testing for gateway the next race. And you know, that that's crazy. That's a full IndyCar cockpit with projectors and screens right in front of you that moves when you turn. And there's a whole team of engineers who not only run the sim, um, but his, uh, sorry, but uh, I have my own engineers there who I work with and who, uh, you know, will work on how they engineer the car for me and how I drive the car to them. Um, so sim, sim training is huge and it's become a huge part of racing. Um, and then there's a lot, a lot, a lot of data and video that we go through, right? I'll spend hours looking through data, looking through, looking through video, making sure that, you know, everything is perfect because when I get to the racetrack, you get such limited track time. You need to know exactly how you take each corner, you know, exactly how you need to hit the brakes, how you need to turn the wheel, what you need to do to be fast, to be successful. And so I'll look through and I'll see what have all the Andretti drivers done around every corner on every racetrack from 2020 all the way back to 2015 when they made this car. Then I'll watch a video from race starts, from myself from previous years, from other drivers from previous years, from the, their IndyCar drivers from previous years. And so there's just tons of data and video and analyzing it and making sure you're, you know exactly what you need to focus on when you get out there. And then, uh, and then I guess uh, the final part of preparation, which isn't really, doesn't really come into play as much as people might think, um, but it's still ultra important is your physical ability, right? I literally just um, got on a city bike and rode back home to get on this LinkedIn live from my trainer where, you know, it's a lot of strength training, a lot of weight training, but then also cardio because you need to be light. The lighter you are, the faster your car is going to go. Um, so there, there's a lot of preparation. And again, it's, it's hours every day to make sure that I'm as ready for every single race as I can be. Yeah, super exciting. We have a couple more questions and comments, but one thing is, um, you know, the, the endurance during the race, like it gets pretty hot in there. And, you know, I hear some, you know, some people lose multiple pounds for every single race. Yeah, yeah, it's about, you know, anywhere from five to 10 pounds a race. Uh, you're burning thousands of calories. I'm trying to remember, uh, my friend had a whoop bracelet on when he, or he puts it on when he races. And I mean, he's burning 3000 calories a race. The cockpit of the car is over 120 degrees. Um, and you're in there for an hour, two hours, just roasting. Uh, you have sp spikes of five, six Gs through some of the corners. Mm. So think about that. You have a helmet on your head, right? It's 10 pounds. You go through a corner, that helmet weighs 50 pounds trying to pull your head off. So you really need to strengthen your neck, strengthen your core, be able to hold yourself up. And I think the biggest thing with racing is, you know, if you're stronger, but other people, you're not going to have a huge advantage. But if you're too weak and you go out there and you, you're fading at the end of the race, if you lose concentration for one second, you make one tiny mistake, you're going to, you can fly into a wall at 200 miles an hour. And that could be the, that'll be the end of your race car. It could be the end of your season. You could hurt yourself. So there's a lot of physical preparation to, to make sure that you can just stay in the zone for that time period. And, um, I'd say the physical stuff comes more into play um, for the endurance races that I run. So I'm also a Lexus driver. I race in IMSA uh, with Lexus along with my Indy Lights and Andretti commitments. Um, so I'm running in the 24 hours of Daytona, the 12 hours of Sebring, uh, six hours at Watkins Glen, and then Petit Le Mans, which is a 10-hour race at Road Atlanta. And Jeez. it's um, it is those races are tough when you go out at Daytona from 2 a.m to 5 a.m. and they're triple standing you for three hours and you've just woken up and it's dark out and it's cold and you can't see and there are 60 other cars on the racetrack. Those are, mm. that's when all that preparation and all the strength work, everything you've done really comes into play. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, you know, the endurance, the, the heat, the um, multiple Gs on the turns, um, 
Yeah, just amazing. And we have more comments, people from Charleston, South Carolina, Minsk, London. Um, and then it, it, one question was, you know, we're talking about the simulator. Uh, how close is it to reality? Or like, what are, are there any differences? Um, so I think physically, the simulators in reality are at this point exactly the same, right? I, I think that there's like zero uh, differentiation, but um, there's just this feeling that you get when you drive a race car. And I know it sounds funny, but you can feel how the car is moving through your butt, through your butt in the seat. You can feel the rear of the car sliding, how it's gripping into the racetrack. That's really how you feel the car. You feel it through your butt and you feel it through your hands on the steering wheel. And you'll never get that sensation of moving and the rear of the car just kind of on edge on a simulator like you will do in real life. Even if the simulator is moving, even if, you know, it's the best simulator in the world and everything looks exactly the way it should and acts exactly the way it should, you'll never get that physical feeling of that sensation of movement. Right. And I would also say that, and the, um, you know, you're on the sim, there's, there's no feeling of, of real danger. Right. And you don't think that there's danger when you're out on the racetrack, but it influences your decisions in a subconscious way. Everything's coming at you so fast. When I'm on the simulator, like Honda, uh, last week, I would do like a 20 lap run, right. And I'd go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And I would keep pushing until I went head first into a wall and destroyed my race car. Mm. Then I'd reset the simulator and I'd go back out again. Um, which is, you know, a good advantage to have on a simulator. You can find those limits, but that's something that you obviously can't do on a race car. So I think, I think those are the main differences is the feeling of the sensation of moving and kind of the risk and danger that you have when you're out there. That's a great yeah. question. Yeah. Great question. And yeah, just in terms of cost, you don't want to crash a car. What is it like 750,000? Yeah. Like yeah. It's, it is an expensive race car. And yeah. here, I actually think I can, I can pull up a, uh, a photo of my race car, a uh, photo mm -hmm. of my sim quickly so that people can see. Um, so this is my simulator here, right? You can see it's three right. flat screen TV screens. It wraps around this metal frame that puts me in my driving position. The seat bumps and moves like the race car. The steering wheel is the same force and the same feeling as the actual race car. And the steering wheel in the sim is actually so powerful that if you crash, you have to take your hands off the wheel, just like in real life, because it'll snap and you can break your thumbs, your wrists Jeez. on the sim when you're on there. So it, it is actually pretty powerful. And I've actually just upgraded my simulator um, to be a uh, virtual reality. So right. uh, that's, you know, we're taking steps in the right direction. And it is actually kind of jarring when you crash in VR and mm -hmm. you see the wall coming at you and you hit it and the steering wheel moves and the seat moves. It's like, Oh my God, you, you really do feel like you're crashing, but, uh, but you're not. <laughs> so, so that's great. I, I'm a big um, believer in virtual reality, augmented reality. So you have the goggle, you know, the, the visor. So as you know, complete surround, but as you turn your head and move, um, but the controls move and is that right? Yeah, yeah, you, you look left, I can look out the window of the car and I can look, you know, look up, look down. And it's actually kind of funny um, because I, I've gotten to the point with my sim racing where I do races and it's either race car drivers or pro sim racers. And, you know, the pro sim racers destroy us. Um, but uh, all of the race car drivers are pretty much using VR to get the most realism out of it. But when you put vr you instantly you lose like a second of lap time mm. you can't be as fast when it's real like that when you have the tv screens in front of you you always go faster it's it's actually really funny that i think it adds a little bit of that risk and that danger and you, you feel like you're you're in the race car and you don't take the risks that you would when you have the screen so people who vr versus screen screen people will always go faster it's actually a little crazy that, that that's a good point too you have the lag time you know, with the precision that you need is, is a big um, issue. And then when you're in the race, you have people communicating uh, through a headset with you? Yeah, yeah. So I have my engineer, my coach, uh, and my crew. They'll all be on my headset. When I'm on the track racing, it's really just my engineer and my coach who will be talking to me. Um, engineer will really be giving me info on the car, right? We got a bunch of live data off the car, so he'll be telling me how things look and 
you know, let's say he's looking at tire pressures. He thinks my right front tire pressure is a little bit too low. He'll tell me I need to get that up and um, he'll give me ways of doing that. You know, there are tools inside my cockpit I can use to change the setup of the race car while I'm driving. So maybe he'll tell me to adjust my tools, maybe soften the front suspension, you know, make the thing turn a little bit more initially, get the tire pressure up. Um, so he'll give me that info. He'll give me, you know, how much is left in the race and gaps and stuff. And then my coach normally go out to corners and will uh, talk to me about, uh, you know, what's happening in those corners, right? He'll say, oh, you know, he'll go to an important corner and say, hey, like, it looks like um, the guy's fast on the track right now. It looks like he's kind of turning a tiny bit earlier than you. It looks like he's breaking about 10 feet later. And so I'll try and make those adjustments on the fly while I'm driving. And um, and we simulate that in the simulator too. I'll get both of them on, on, on my headset while I'm driving and I'll drive and we'll just treat it like it's a normal, a normal race. Anytime I go on the simulator, it's treated like it's a normal practice session, qualifying race, and we'll deal with it exactly the same. I'll engineer the car and then they'll coach me and they'll give me the data that I need to know to go faster while I'm driving. And, um, I think, you know, that's to help, to help us go faster on the sim, but also to make sure that when we show up at the race weekend, we know how to communicate with one another and our processes are kind of, kind of down, ready to go. Great. And yeah, the special call out to your, uh, you know, crew chief and the whole crew. I've seen them in action, you know, preparing during the race, after the race, there is a ton going in. And is it the group crew chief, but you have, um, you know, RKM has the only female, is it crew chief or engineering chief of all? Yeah, we have, yeah. Yeah, we have the only female car chief in IndyCar. Um, so yeah, Jessica's, Jessica's great to work with. So it's been awesome having her on board. That's it's cool to say, but I also know I have one of the best people out there. So it doesn't doesn't matter if she's a male yeah. or female. We're still gonna beat everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's a it, it, yeah, it's a cool point. Uh, but yeah, I've seen her in action. It's um, formidable uh, the effort that's involved uh, to oh, say geez. the least. She, I would not fight her. She is way stronger <laughs> than I am. She can pick up that car and move it when she has to. <laughs> Cool. So one question uh, came in, and maybe this could be a good time to pull up um, you know, some like uh, examples of the data that you use. But one of the questions: any predictive modeling or use of analytics for tire wear, track surface, surface temp, weather conditions, or you know, if you want to go into that, or just like in general, like what type of data do, uh, do you use? Um, so, so that's a great question. Um, yeah, that is something that's done um, for sure. You know, my en the engineering team <clears throat> will definitely look through and look at, okay, what's tire we're going to be, you know, how is when the weather changes because weather is a huge factor to the racetrack and the race car. The way the race car handles, the way it performs is very, very weather dependent. I mean, it's one, two degree of track tip change and everything's, everything you've, done change the way you're driving the car is just out the window you totally change your driving style totally change the race car wind direction you know track surface temp air temp all that things make a difference um now i know you know the engineer gives me the information when i get in the car okay hey the wind is now going northeast instead of southeast so you know you're gonna have a headwind into turn one but a tailwind into turn three so you can break later into one and you know, track temp has risen about 10 degrees. So it's going to be a little bit more greasy and slicker out there, but your tires are going to come in faster. And so I know how I have to adjust my driving for each of those things, but that's never data that I go into. You know, the engineers analyze these things to make sure that the car is inch perfect. Um, but this, I'll kind of show you guys the data that I look through. And as a driver, you know, what I do to kind of get the most out of myself. Right, so we can we can scroll down here quickly to some data. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is one lap of driver data uh, from Watkins Glen International Raceway. So that's in upstate New York. And driver data is the data that us drivers will look at before and after every session. Our race cars they have over three hundred sensors on them, collecting data in real time to the, you know, 10,000th of a second or, or smaller. Um, but really the way that it's broken up is I'm the race car driver, right? So it's my job to drive the race car to the best of my ability. 
and to help the engineer aid him in engineering the race car. The engineer has to engineer the race car. So this is, I think, seven channels of data that I will look at to make sure I'm getting the most out of myself. The engineer will be looking at the other 290 channels to make sure that the car um, is running the way it should and we're getting the most out of performance physically, right, with changing conditions and with everything. Um, but this is driver data. I'll kind of take you guys through it and kind of explain what you're looking at. Uh, just like we would, you know, after any qualifying race practice session test day, this is what we look at. And debriefs are crazy long. If we, you know, have a 30 minute practice session, we're going to spend an hour and a half looking through this data, looking through video. So I'll take you through what each trace is and kind of explain, explain it. Uh, so you can see that there's a blue line and a red line. The blue line is my fastest lap from practice one. The red line is the fastest lap of my teammate from you know practice one as well. Uh, this top line is the time difference. So the blue line is flat because it was faster. The red line, which is my teammate, whenever it goes down, that's where he goes faster or gains time on me. Whenever it goes up, that's where he loses time or goes slower than me. Hands it way above me because I was way faster. Um, Second one here is the RPM of the engine. The third is the speed of the race car. Um, the fourth is the gearings, when we upshift, when we downshift, what gear we're in. The fifth is the angle of the steering wheel. So down is right and up is left. The sixth trace here is the brake trace. This is probably the most important, right? The harder you hit the brakes, the more efficiently you slow down the car and the higher that line goes. Then the very bottom trace here is the angle of the throttle pedal at every point in the lap. So let's say this was a normal driver debrief. We would go and we would analyze every corner individually, right? So now we're zoomed in on turn one and we'd go through and we'd look at what am I doing that allows me to gain or lose time? What do I need to do better? How do I go faster? If I'm faster, what am I doing that helps me gain time? What can I learn from that, right? Because something I've very recently learned is you can't just learn you have to learn from yourself when you go fast and you have to learn from others when you're going slow right you have to look at what you're doing when you're the fastest guy out there and you're dominating you have to see why am i fast when you're the slowest guy out there and you're struggling you have to look at what are what do i need to do to be fast what jumps do i need to take um and when we look through i'll take you through this very quickly when we look through data you know the first place we'll always go and look will be the brake trace and that's because time in racing is always gained and lost on the brakes, right? The harder you hit the brake pedal, more efficiently you slow the car down and everyone's going as fast as they can on the straights. And in delights, everyone's in the same car, same engine, same tire. So it comes down to how you drive the race car, how the team engineers the race car. And so you're driving and you're braking and the precision, <laughs> excuse me, is super important. Um, so when I look at this brake trace, the first thing I see is that the blue line is, uh, goes up about three meters later than, than the red line. So I'm breaking about three meters later than my teammate. What I'm also seeing is that the blue line goes higher than the red line. And that means I'm hitting the brakes more aggressively. So I'm hitting 1,088 PSI brake pressure whereas my teammates only hitting 944. And then I slowed the car down more efficiently. That allows the brakes, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, to go flat about 15 meters earlier. So the blue line goes flat 15 meters earlier than the red line, right? So how does this happen? There's a technique to braking because there's no driver aids in our cars. Mm -hmm. um, the you want to hit the brakes as hard as you can at first and then slowly come off, right? There's no ABS to help you. So you have to feel that brake pedal with your foot, hit it super hard. When you're going your fastest, that's when you have the most energy in your tires and your brakes. So you can hit the brakes super hard. Then I start to slow down. You want to slowly release off the brakes, right? So I hit a higher initial peak pressure on my brakes. I was able to brake a little bit harder. I was closer to that limit of how much the car can handle. And then I did a better job releasing right on the limit. So I was able to get off the brakes earlier, and roll more speed into the corner than he was. Right, so we'll go through and we'll analyze the brakes. We'll look at brake traces. 
look at throttle traces, right? I get off the brakes 15 meters earlier. That means you look at the very bottom of the throttle trace, the blue line goes up 15 meters before the red line. I'm on the gas 15 meters before my teammate and accelerating out of the corner. So this is all the data that we'll look at. And then very quickly, I'll show you an example of some onboard video that we'd look at as well. Right, so what we normally do is we watch, we look at the data, analyze the data, see what's going on. And then from there we go and we look at onboard video and you can kind of combine the two. The data shows you everything you're doing in the car. And then the onboard video will show you how you're driving with other cars, what lines you taking, are you hitting any bumps, any curbs that are upsetting the car, you know, what's really happening out on that racetrack. Um, and it kind of gives you this full picture, right? So here we would look at this video and we would see, um, you know, my hands are a little bit over 90 degrees here in turn five. I'm right behind, you know, the car in front. So that means that I'm going to lose a little grip driving right behind someone else. Um, and so what am I doing to kind of counteract that? I'm turning as much as I can because my hands are at 90. You don't want to turn any more than that. So what I have to do is I put my left hand side tires on this red and yellow curb. This kind of makes the car slide a little bit, but I, that's the fastest way through this corner, you know, when you're right behind someone else. So make the car slide that tiny bit, get it pointed, get on the gas fast out of the corner. You know, there are no bumps or anything you really take note of here, but the inside, that gray curbing on the inside of the red and yellow curbing is super jagged. So you want to get as close to that as you can, but if you hit it, you could damage your car. Right, and then we'd go back and look at the we look at the video and we see okay it looks like you're trailing the brakes all the way to the apex of this corner so you're doing everything you can to to get the car to turn as much as you want and, you know really combine data and video and look at you know not just how you're driving but then how you're racing other cars right so this is an example uh turn 12 at road america mm -hmm. you see there's a guy on my left trying to go around the outside of me and i've kind of driven him off the racetrack here so i've given him you know pretty much two options at this point you can either go off, use all this extra road, go across the grass and go off the racetrack because he tried to go around the outside of me. Or he can turn in and hit me, possibly end both of our races. Maybe he's able to hold second place and you know, maybe he has a little bit of damage, but we keep going. So, you know, kind of I look through this with my coach, me to analyze, okay, well, you're racing against this guy, so he's actually a little bit more conservative. He'll go off the track, whereas that other guy might have hit you. So this was a smart move to drive him off. He actually ended up going off onto the grass and fell back to like eighth because he tried to pass me for second really early on in the race and tried to be really aggressive. So we'll always be analyzing how we're driving the car, but also what we're doing in terms of race crash, how we're driving around other drivers. So that yeah, I remember that was a little bit of a detour, part. but yeah. No, that was great. That was a, you know, a big part uh, of what, you're, you know, what Gary was telling us is uh, you know, people analyze how aggressive or non-aggressive are. So, um, if you are too passive, um, you know, people, you know, you get you get a reputation, and people consistently take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot of, uh, especially in preseason testing, before the year even starts. There's a lot of, you know, figuring out what we can do. Right? Like, who are you racing against? who's out of their minds crazy, gonna hit you for no reason, and who is really tentative, who's really scared to get into an accident. And, you know, you always find those guys that you always figure out who's passive, who's gonna let you kind of have that position and try and save their car. And then you bully, you bully that person as much as you can, right? Because if you know, if you throw it at someone, they're gonna be better your way, then you're gonna throw it at them again and again and again and again every time you have the opportunity. And it almost turns into this game of chicken, right? You go into a corner with someone, one of you guys has one of you guys has to back out, or you guys are gonna crash into each other, who's gonna be the one to back out? And you need to know who's gonna be the guy to back out and who's gonna be the guy who's gonna stuff it in there and risk having that crash, making you know, waiting for you to move out of the way. So with the non aggressive guys, you throw it at them. With the aggressive guys, you almost have to trick them into making a mistake, right? You pretend you're going to throw it at them. They try and defend. They're super, you know, reactionary. And then you kind of cut back underneath them and get by them. So you analyze your opponents. I think that's a big part of racing, a big part of, uh, you know, being smart for not just a race, but for an entire calendar, right? When you're doing 20 races against the same 15 drivers, you need to know who you're racing against. So you can get the most out of it, get the most out of them. Yeah, I love that part of sports and competition and 
lots of parallels to pretty much every industry where you have um, like the, the human intelligence, which is what we're talking about. How do you know your opponent? And then the artificial or the, the intelligence, um, you know, what can you crunch numbers with? And you need to really combine the two to be in the best position to win. So I, I love examples like this in, in your world. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's super interesting. And it's part of the reason I love racing, right, is all the human element of it of, you know, yeah, we're in these super highly tuned machines going 215 miles an hour. And then you're right next to another guy. And like, what's what's he going to do? You know, is he is he going to try and push you into that wall? Is he going to back out and give you all the space you need? Like, what's going to happen? And how do I put myself in the best position to go and win this race? And that's the part that I love about racing. That's what I find the most enjoyable is like I go out and I am pushing myself to the absolute limit and I'm pushing everyone else to the absolute limit around me. So when I go out and I'm racing against some guy and he races me so hard and we're inches away from hitting each other and we're going side by side for three, four corners, I, I love that. And mm -hmm. I'll always, you know, it, even if it holds me back in the race a little bit, I'll always say like that was so much fun and i'll be like hey man that was that was such a good time i really enjoyed that um so no that's that's what i love about racing and um yeah i mean there's just so much that goes on from from an ai side that i don't think i even see you know i i think the engineers hide that stuff from me because they don't want me to see it for the reason of they don't want me to get confused and they don't want me to start overthinking how i'm driving this race car but I think if I knew what the team was doing and how they were getting performance out of their car and how they were predicting things like the weather, how the car was going to change, things like that, they don't want me taking those systems to another team the next year and having an advantage over them, right? Because that's a team's data is like their is their key to success, right? All the data that Andretti has, that is how we win races is we have all this data we look through it we know exactly how we need to set up our cars we know exactly how we need to drive these cars if we didn't have that data if we lost that uh, i think there'd be no way for us to do well because we wouldn't be able to pull from that information and know exactly what has to happen for us to win and you see it there's been you know race teams that have had all their data held at ransom i've seen you know i know one team ended up buying their data back for i think it was two million dollars a few years wow. ago because you know they people know that's exactly what what they need that's exactly where they get the performance from exactly yeah that, that it's a challenge in the world you know data is is uh, key they, they say data is the new oil but now analytics on top of the data and artificial intelligence on top of it uh, you know, could give you even more of an advantage um, competitively. And um, yeah, yeah, so so that's uh, you know, one of the big considerations. Another one um, that could be cool to talk about is uh, one of the things you have in control is that, was it press the pass? It's where every race you have a certain number of times you can accelerate. Um, uh, and, and can you tell a little bit about like how many, like what it is you have to be certain distance behind another car to be able to press it. That's another big aspect of your strategy in the game. Yeah, yeah, so we have push the pass and indie lights. Basically the way it works is that the button on your steering wheel, when you push it, you get an extra 15, uh, 50 horsepower. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and so basically what you do is you would just push the button all the time to go faster, right? But you only get to hit the button 15 times. And when you hit push to pass, you get it for 15 seconds. So you have to strategize, when am I going to use my push to pass? Do I want to save it for the end? Do I want to use it at the beginning? And you can only use push to pass when you're a second and a half behind the car in front. So if you're leading the whole race, you never get to use it. But if you're in second, you can use it as long as you're within that range of the guy in front. So the push to pass is, it's fun. It's strategy. And you know, all the other guys around you are using it. You know, the start of the race, everyone's pressing the button. Maybe you can be smart and you can sit there and wait till the end, have a bunch of pushes left and just drive around the field. Or vice versa. Maybe you want to push it a ton, get by a bunch of people at the beginning and then just block for the rest of the race. So it's uh, it's a fun, it's fun. And it adds to strategy. 
And I mean, you just feel like you're going so fast when you use it. It's <laughs> what's the example we use? It's the example we use. It's like, it's like hard drugs, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I just want to keep pressing the button, but all of a sudden you're out and you're really sad and guys are flying by you. So um, we're always trying to uh, figure out when we want to use it. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, and that, that's a big thing. Like watching um, the race with, with your parents, uh, you know, I know they're, they're very nervous or very excited, but in a lot of it is, you know, how many press to passes do you have left compared to the others and sometimes saving them up. And then you know, we, we, um, one city we I, I didn't mention was in Detroit, kind of in the river uh, between Windsor, Canada and Detroit, beautiful racetrack, Bell Island. Um, but that was one I remember um, had a lot of turns and a, a lot of areas and every you know, opportunity to pass or attempt to pass, I could almost like ESP feel your aggression coming up. Like one person passed you and it seemed to piss you off. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a car going quickly, but my ESP was like, you got real aggressive. You're like, this guy is not gonna pass me. So I, I loved watching that. What was going through yeah. your head? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, and that's, that's the thing too, is like when someone gets by you, yeah, sure they pass you. But in your head, you're like, oh, no, they, they use push to pass. I'm sure you use like three pushes to get by me. I'm faster than them. I'm going to use a bunch and get them back. And uh, no, it's it's when someone gets by you, I mean, yeah, it's frustrating. But I, I almost feel like you have to think about the race as a whole, right? You think about, okay, you think about it in very simple terms. The race is the first one to cross the line in that certain number of laps, right? It's the fastest way from point A to point B. So if someone gets by me, I'm not going to fight them super, super hard and just like push them to the absolute limit, right? If someone's fighting me, I'm going to look for my opportunity to get by them in the fastest way I possibly can, right? Because ultimately, I want to do the best I can. So I want to get to that finish line as fast as possible. So I'm not going to hold myself back by getting caught up with that guy that just passed me. Yeah, sure, I lost that one position. Let's think about it. Is my, is my best strategy call right now to just push as hard as I can and drive around that guy and maybe burn off my tires, maybe even drive into the wall, maybe use all my push to pass, or is it to wait here think, okay, this is the situation I'm in. What are we going to salvage from it? And, you know, if, if fifth is the best I'm going to do today, then let's make sure we get that fifth place and let's sure make sure we execute, right? It's, yeah, are, are, you've been to a bunch of races. You've seen me get fired up, but um, mm -hmm. I think the best way to do it is to try and be calm and level head and think about the race as a whole because they're long races. They're hour long races. And it's the same in, uh, in the endurance races, right? When you get in the car, I, whenever I do those races, when I get in the car, I have the engineer tell me how much time is left in the race. Because like you jump in at Daytona, there's 60 other guys out there, you know, three people blow by you. When you make a mistake in one corner, you get fired up. You have to remember that there's 18 hours left, you know, there's 16 hours left. <laughs> You don't need to drive by those guys at the next hour. You have another 18 hours to pass them back. So um, it's definitely just trying to have the right mindset and trying to think about the race as a whole. I think that's important to, to do that. But like you said, I think you do have to have some aggression. You need to be passionate about it. And I'm definitely more on the aggressive, passionate side. Yeah. And yeah, a lot, a lot of great comments, um, like fast and furious. And one question was the push to pass sounds like a video game. Are there any racing games that you enjoy playing or do you turn off racing when when, uh, when you're not doing it i am so good at mario kart i have <laughs> won every cup in every class i'm going i do time trials now in mario kart and try to go for like world records i love mario kart um i do a lot of iRacing. racing i racing is kind of the video game that uh all the race car drivers mm -hmm. play um, it's super realistic. You know, we put it on our simulators along with uh, the software that we use to actually train. And um, yeah, iRacing is a great way to a great way to get a feel for racing, but without actually racing and um, going out on the racetrack. Yeah, uh, Mark, Mario Kart. It's great. I I actually did some fun things with George. Um, we um, oh. took the golf cart. Like uh, he gets an electric oh golf God. cart, and we would kind of quote unquote race around behind the scenes. That was kind of epically funny. Oh, he's out of control on those golf carts. <laughs> he's out of control. Yeah, you could you see the race car driver come out and 
I, I think if it was at Detroit, I remember because he had this whole system of you have to look through this hospitality trailer to see if there's a right. car coming, know if you can push around this corner. I was like, you're you're out of control. Um, yeah, but it was it was fun. Like we were able to like go to different parts of the race, and, and people don't realize like race track is is pretty big, and some yeah. like a, as a, a a fan or a spectator, you're allowed to go to different parts of the track to watch like a straightaway or a turn. And you can get pretty close, um, you know, where the wind, you feel the wind, like from the car as a spectator. And then, you know, for, for you know, my perspective, you know, being with you and everyone being behind the scenes, you could really get these incredible vantage points. But just encourage everyone listening, if you haven't been to one of the races, it it's really amazing. You should try it out. Oh, it's awesome. It's I love going to racetracks even when I'm not racing. I went to the Formula E race in Brooklyn um a while ago. And uh yeah, no, it's it's a great you can get so close. It's so much fun. IndyCar races are like nothing else. You get so much access, so much opportunity from IndyCar races and and you're right, the tracks are so big. You know, you go to a place like Road America, it's a four mile track. There's hundreds of acres. You know, it's and it's like the most socially distant sport ever. You if you're getting within six feet of someone in, on the racetrack, then it's getting pretty it's getting pretty hairy right. and you know you always have your helmet on huge area you can space people out right it's, it's the most best way to do it in a covid you know socially distant safe way and um no that they're, they're awesome fun events and i'll be on the indycar races so i hope i see a bunch of you guys there um i see a i see a few other questions you know why is there a limit yeah. to push to pass opportunities and um i think it's it because they want to make it strategy they want to make it strategy related right if you could press it the whole time then you just i would tape down the button i'd have it going the whole time and just drive a faster race car and win the race but you they want the drivers to have to strategize to think about it and then you know from a from an outside perspective you know the commentators everybody watching they know like oh he's used all this push to pass so he might be in third right now but those guys are gonna fly by him at the end and makes you think it makes it the racing a little bit more exciting and it makes passing more easier and more fun um and then also you know they don't want to give us any more than they already do uh because it it i think it puts a lot of strain on the engine when we use push to pass you know it's that 15 seconds yeah. 15 times we did a bunch i tried to practice with it and testing and the engine people were like you should you should stop doing that because your engine's going to blow up if you keep if you keep practicing with it <laughs> Um, cause it's, it's pretty powerful. It really just, it just opens up the turbo and just extracts more from the turbo. So it's pretty intense. That, that's awesome. And yeah. Just a reminder, you know, we have like six, seven minutes left. So get more questions. And I have like another three hours of, of discussion we can do, but, um, but I prefer to get folks, uh, you know, questions and, and what they want to talk about. Um, I don't know, but, but before we wrap up any fun, fun stories that you wanted to share. It any fun stories i mean every race weekend so fun and so unique and i love it um any fun stories wow man i feel like there's so so many to pick from i mean there's racing has really brought me like through north america through the world you know i have memories of you know sitting on dune buggies and like the arabian desert before i raced in dubai without cell service trying to find my way back and uh, you know, going to the middle of nowhere, Ohio, and got to dinner with my whole team and us throwing taco shells at each other. And <laughs> it's just, they call it, it's like a, they call it like a traveling circus, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we just, we show up at the track, we unload our stuff, we go, we race, we push each other as hard as we can. And then we pack our stuff back up. And, you know, I'll never be best friends with anyone that I race against, but we mm -hmm. all still, you know, we're all still talkative and friendly. And one of my teammates came to town uh, the New York City uh, a couple weeks ago, and we went and got dinner and hung out. And so we we're all cordial. I'd say we're cordial. We're none of us are best mm -hmm. friends, but we're all cordial, and it's fun. It's fun. I feel like I have this bond with these people that I race against, and I feel like you've been here enough weekends, Ari, mm -hmm. where I feel like I I know you super well, and yeah, it's you're like a part of the part of the team. Yeah, I I I appreciate that wholeheartedly. I I, I feel. Um, yeah, I feel like that sense of camaraderie going from city to city and, and talking uh, in between and all of our communication and, and just seeing it. And yeah, you know, circus is, is one word, but like the traveling part was a big part of it too. It was like really impressive. There's entire sections set up. There's 
like a, a, a war room, so to speak, like a, a control center. Um, but and, and there's a big to do, like there's trucks to transport the cars. Um, you know, they get lifted up into these trucks, uh, all the equipment, all the sleeping arrangements. You have a whole crew to just take care logistically of bringing everything from city to city. And like a race ends, maybe on a Sunday, you may have to be halfway across the country three, four days later. It's, it's like a big logistics, but it's a big camaraderie as well. Um, you know, the, the staff behind you, uh, you know, from the crew chief to the, the pit, which we hadn't talked about, that that's a spot in case there's some trouble that you could stop the communication before the game, it, uh, you know, before the races. Um, it, it, it's all part of that bigger effort that, uh, you know, it's been a privilege to be behind the scenes, but a lot of people, you know, uh, don't see that. If you're a spectator, you kind of show up, the cars magically appear uh, and they race, but there's just so many things I learned, like, was it the first gear goes up to 80 miles an hour? That was a, a fun takeaway. So you, oh, you yeah. don't even drive the car behind the scenes. You have people like pulling it or pushing it um, because of that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, the, the cars are not meant to go slowly. They do not go around tight corners. They have to be pulled by, uh, by a tugger. Um, yeah, I think we have a couple more questions here. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm putting some so, up. Yeah, how do I see technology changing and racing in 20 years? Um, I think everything's going to go towards hybrid. Hybrid cars are the fastest, right? Because then you have the electric motor to pull power from and the combustion engine to power the car. So I could see pretty much all of racing being hybrid and especially, you know, indie cars, hyper cars, uh, prototypes, everything will be hybrid racing. And I think I just see the data getting more and more advanced. And I think, you know, that we have everything we need to know about the car, right? I think data it's going to start to seep over more and more into the driver part of things. I think you're going to be analyzing me and my body and what's going on in my head through sensors, through data, a lot more than is already done. Right. When you look at performance, you know, where's my heart rate at? Where's, you know, where am I looking? You know, trace my eyes. What part of the track am I looking at? You know, what's really happening on the physical side to me. And you're going to see a lot more data on that end. And I only see more, more AI and more, uh, technology being implemented in that way. I think teams have, you know, really started to implement it. And I think you see a lot of racing teams having success that, that are doing that. Um, and I mean, at this point, you know, we have every car, we have an engineer and assistant engineer at this point, because we have so much data that we have to hire a, t a second person, the first engineer, he's the car engineer. He you know, decides what changes are we're making. He works with me. Then the assistant engineer, his job is just to literally look through every data trace to make sure that nothing's broken, to make sure everything's running right. Because if that doesn't happen, something we would definitely miss something. The car would definitely break. Um, so yeah, that's I think we see a lot more AI to kind of take over those processes and and make it a lot simpler. And then the people can focus on the people things of driving and engineering and doing the physical stuff to the car. So that's where I see racing going in 20 years. Um, any plans to incorporate computer vision to provide reconditions and or et cetera to the driver directly in a live environment? And he's, um, he made recommendations instead of recommendations. Yeah. yeah. Um, I could see that technology coming. I could see racing series blocking it. I think one of the most fun parts about racing is you're you're a human right? It doesn't matter if the track tip changes three degrees and the wind direction changes and the humidity changes and you've towed out the rear 20 mil and you still got to go out there and be the guy to drive it. If you have computers who start driving the car, I think series would start to uh, start to frown upon that. But I think, I think you see it happening in little, little ways. Like in my, in my Lexus, um, we've now plugged into the radio, a, uh, a tool, that basically whenever I overlap the brake and the throttle, because that will damage our brakes for a long race, whenever I overlap the pedals, it starts to beep in my ears. So I know that I'm, so it helps me just release off the brake really quickly to get off and make sure that I'm, I'm not destroying the car, not even destroying the car, hurting performance later on the race. And we have, you know, I don't, we have the shift lights. Those are now shift beeps in our ears. So I don't have to look at anything. I hear the beep and I press a button, I upshift. Um, you know, we have predictive lap time on our dash. 
Uh, we have all the info in the car and our dashes. I think there's a lot of stuff to help us already. And I think it's being weaseled in, in ways that you can't really, that it's being hidden from, from series and stuff. So it doesn't become a problem like that, but, uh, yeah, I definitely see it being less driver and more computer as the, as the years go on. And I see that happening with uh, the Indy autonomous challenge that's happening right now. It's going to be the fastest autonomous car race in the world. It's going to be held in October at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's in cars based off my Indy Lights car. I'm an advisor for West Point, uh, Purdue, and MIT. Mm -hmm. And, you know, totally self-driven race cars going 200 miles an hour. I mean, that, how long is it until uh, until I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not hired anymore? How long until they fire <laughs> me and they put a computer in my car? Um, but, yeah, it's, it's super impressive to see what they're doing and, I remember it was a few months ago uh, when the simulation beat my fastest time around the speedway by 0.1 of a mile an hour and everyone made fun of me for like a week. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think that's definitely the, the way things are going to go. Yeah, that, that, that's great. You brought that up. I was going to say, hey, we're out of time, but one question, autonomous driving, but you um, proactively brought that up. And yeah, uh, part of this uh, More Intelligent Tomorrow podcast, and we had uh, General Petraeus on, and he was talking about the uh, you know fighter jets of how an AI uh, you know based uh, fighter jet beat out a human in, in a you know, simulated dogfight. So it, it's coming. Um, I still think people are going to want to pay to see uh, humans race, but uh, you know coming up later this year, I definitely would pay to see autonomous vehicles race. Um, so I, I would personally go to both, but. It's very, very fascinating um, to see to see it all. But if it all goes completely automated, I think you would still, uh, you know, be part of the training of, of that autonomous, you know, what your strategies are and so on. But I think um, for your lifetime, at least, I know uh, there, there's some drivers going what into their 40s still. Uh, you know, through your lifetime, I think you're good. But it'll be interesting to see how how the autonomous and, and humans. Uh, end up merging or being in parallel. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. No, it's going to be interesting to see how it, how it happens, and I'm glad I'm aligned with you know people like Data Robot who are going to make sure that when the when the robots are taking over my race car, that I have the fastest race car. <laughs> well, make we, sure that we, car knows exactly how to work. Yeah, we we completely appreciate the partnership. I can't wait to see you again in St. Louis, and then uh, you know going to bunch of uh, places, Monterey and Long Beach, and then you're going back to Atlanta and probably missing a few cities, but it's pretty ambitious, but I, I love our, our partnership and collaboration and uh, very appreciative of you being on LinkedIn Live, as well as uh, appreciative of the audience um, asking and, and commenting uh, throughout. So uh, any, any other final words? Uh, um, for me, I mean, I. I, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see you next week. <laughs> and um, no, I, I can't thank Data Robot enough. You know, they've, they've been the ones who've made this year happen. They've been the ones who've, you know, put us out in the racetrack. And I've, I said it in the blog, but I've learned so much from you guys and so much from the people that I get to spend time with at the racetrack. And it, it really has been an awesome, an awesome year because of, because of Data Robot. And, you know, thanks to everyone for joining. I uh, see Eric finished this off with saying humans will be the X factor in races. So it makes me feel a little better about my employment. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's been an awesome year. And, you know, it really is something that I hope we can continue on for, for more years because I'm, I'm having such a good time. Great. Well, thank you again. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.